So to prove that the arithmetic means converge to f, we have to show that delta nx that you see in this slide goes to 0. Delta nx is dominated by integral minus pi to pi k n t mod f of x minus t minus f x dt. So let us estimate this integral. Let us see what this integral does. We must now bring in the epsilons and deltas. It's time to invoke the epsilons and deltas. Let's do so. Let epsilon greater than 0 be arbitrary. Recall that we have a function which is 2 pi periodic and continuous on the real line. Such a function must be uniformly continuous. I'd like you to think about this. Why should a 2 pi periodic continuous function be uniformly continuous? So by uniform continuity, there is a delta greater than 0 such that mod of f of x minus t minus f of x less than epsilon by 2 when mod t less than delta. The delta does not depend on x. This is the meaning of uniform continuity. So now let us split the integral that you saw in the last slide into two integrals. So delta nx is integral of k n t into mod of f of x minus t minus f of x dt. The integral over mod t less than delta plus the integral of the same thing. Integral k n t mod f of x minus t minus f of x dt but mod t between delta and pi. In the first piece, we use the uniform continuity. Mod of f of x minus t minus f of x is less than epsilon by 2. The epsilon by 2 comes out of the integral as you see. What are you left with? Integral k n t dt mod t less than or equal to delta. Now remember k n is a positive kernel. k n is a positive kernel. So the integral over mod t less than or equal to delta will be less than or equal to integral of k n t dt mod t less than or equal to pi. But integral k n t dt mod t less than or equal to pi is 1. We saw that. So the first piece is simply less than epsilon by 2. Now turn to the second piece. In the second piece, we got k n t into mod of f of x minus t minus f of x. Now f of x is uniformly continuous, so it is bounded. It is 2 pi periodic uniform continuous. So it is bounded by say m. m is the upper bound. And so mod of f of x minus t minus f x is less than or equal to 2 m. So the second integral is less than or equal to 2 m times integral k n t dt where the integral is over delta less than or equal to mod t less than or equal to pi. Now let us prove that the second piece is also less than epsilon by 2 for all n large enough. Let us do this carefully and slowly. Now delta less than or equal to mod t less than or equal to pi means delta by 2 less than mod t by 2 less than pi by 2. Now remember that sine is monotone in the interval 0 to pi by 2. It is a monotone increasing function. So sin squared delta by 2 is going to be less than or equal to sin squared t by 2. So in the failure kernel that you see in the second line k n t, what is the numerator? Sin squared n plus 1 t by 2. That sin squared business is less than or equal to 1. Denominator you have got a 2 times n plus 1 pi. So 2 pi anyway is large, so 1 upon 2 pi is less than 1. So you are simply left with 1 upon n plus 1 and there is a sin squared t by 2 in the denominator. Sin squared t by 2 exceeds sin squared delta by 2 and so being in the denominator, I can replace sin squared t by 2 by sin squared delta by 2. So we get 0 less than or equal to kn and kn is less than or equal to 1 upon n plus 1 sin squared delta by 2. So now suppose if I choose my n naught to be large, then this 1 upon n plus 1 sin squared delta by 2 is going to be small. That is the idea. So what do we get? 0 less than or equal to delta nx less than or equal to 
epsilon by 2 plus 2m integral k n t dt delta less than or equal to t less than or equal to pi. So, what have we seen? k n is less than or equal to 1 upon n plus 1 sin squared delta by 2 which is what I put in over there and I am integrating it over an interval of length 2 pi at max. So, we get 4 m pi upon n plus 1 sin squared delta by 2 that is what I get finally. So, I get an upper bound for delta n x namely epsilon by 2 plus 4 m pi by n plus 1 sin squared delta by 2. So, now we know if we choose n naught to be larger than 8 m pi upon epsilon sin squared delta by 2 then n bigger than n naught will immediately give me delta n x less than epsilon. So, we have proved that delta n x goes to 0 uniformly as n goes to infinity. So, n naught will depend on epsilon and delta, but remember delta is independent of x and therefore, the convergence is uniform. That completes the proof of Fajer's theorem. I just would like to make one comment. It is exactly in this slide where we are used several times that the Fajer kernel is positive. In the very first piece when mod t less than delta, we use the fact that mod f x minus t minus f x is less than epsilon by 2 by uniform continuity and then we are left with this integral k n t dt and that integral was 1. If you try to play the same game with the Dirichlet kernel and if you try to use this idea and prove that every continuous function has convergent Fourier series, you will fail in your endeavor because first of all the result is false. Second and more importantly, this tells us exactly why the result holds here for the Fajer kernel, but it fails for the Dirichlet kernel because the Dirichlet kernel is not a positive kernel. You could try to put an absolute value on the Dirichlet kernel. Instead of dnt, you can try to work with mod dnt, but you will encounter a new difficulty. Integral mod dnt is not 1, it goes to infinity. So, this proof, if you try to imitate this proof with the Dirichlet kernel, it will fail. That is why you cannot prove that the Fourier series of a continuous function will converge point wise. This is where the difficulty lies. The Dirichlet kernel is not a positive kernel. If you take its absolute value, its integral from minus pi to pi will shoot off to infinity. And so, this, this kind of argument will completely break down. And it works for the Fajer kernel because the Fajer kernel is a positive kernel. Let us now look at an application of Fajer's theorem. One application of Fajer's theorem is corollary 27. The set of all trigonometric polynomials is dense in the set of all 2 pi periodic continuous functions in the following sense. Given a 2 pi periodic continuous function f and epsilon greater than 0, I can find a trigonometric polynomial p and x such that the supremum of mod f x minus p and x is less than epsilon by root 2 pi, supremum taken over minus pi to pi. What is the trigonometric polynomial? Let me recall, it is simply a finite linear combination of 1 sin x, cos x, sin 2 x, cos 2 x, etc. If you take a finitely many of them and take their linear combination, you get a trigonometric polynomial. So, what the corollary says is that every 2 pi periodic continuous function can be approximated by trigonometric polynomials in supremum norm. Now, here is a little exercise use this corollary to prove that if you take a function in L2, if you take a function in L2, then norm of f x minus p n x will be less than epsilon in L2 norm. So, this is a little exercise for you. Now, let us elaborate on this exercise a little bit. Theorem 28, trigonometric polynomials are dense in L2 of minus pi to pi. So, the exercise which I have given you has been fleshed out in detail. If f is in L2 of minus pi pi, then given any epsilon greater than 0, there is a trigonometric polynomial p n x such that 
the L2 norm of fx minus p and x is less than epsilon. The proof proceeds in four steps and I'll just outline these four steps and I'll leave the details for you to fill in. Step number one is to appeal to Lusin's theorem. What is Lusin's theorem? Lusin's theorem says that every L2 function can be approximated by a continuous function in L2 norm. More generally, any L1 function or any LP function where P is between 1 and infinity, infinity excluded, can be approximated by a continuous function in LP norm. So, here P is 2. So, given any L2 function f, there is a continuous function g from minus pi to pi such that integral minus pi to pi mod fx minus gx the whole square dx less than epsilon squared by 8. The 8 is there so that the whole thing when you add up becomes nice and give you epsilon. That is the only reason why the 8 is there. The next step is this function gx is continuous. So, take its supremum capital M. Now, if you take an L2 function and you take its square, then mod fx squared is an integrable function. Integrable means what? The area under the graph is finite. So, if you take out a small piece of length delta, the area under that piece is going to be negligibly small. So, what does it say? There is a delta greater than 0 such that integral mod fx squared dx from pi minus delta to delta is negligibly small. And then when you take integral m squared dx mod x between pi minus delta and delta, that is also negligibly small. So, sum total of these two is negligibly small. How small do I want? I want it to be less than epsilon squared by 8. So, that is step number 2. Now, after this, what we do is that we go to step number 3. We select a continuous function gx such that capital GX equal to little gx from mod x less than or equal to pi minus delta. On this large sub interval of minus pi pi, capital GX and little gx agree. And on the end points plus pi and minus pi, I fix the value of capital G to be 0. So, now you have got a two points minus pi and pi and you have got a closed sub interval mod x less than or equal to pi minus delta. So, together that is a closed subset of minus pi pi and I defined a continuous function capital G. By Tietze's extension theorem, this capital G will extend as a continuous function on minus pi pi. The Tietze's extension theorem also tells you that the extension has the same upper bound as the original function G namely capital M. So, now let us work with this extension capital G and let us estimate mod fx minus capital Gx squared integral minus pi to pi equals the integral mod x less than or equal to pi minus delta plus the integral mod x greater than or equal to pi minus delta. Correct? Now, mod of fx minus capital Gx squared is mod fx squared plus mod Gx squared, but there is a middle term, right? 2 times fx into Gx, but 2ab is going to be less than or equal to a squared plus b squared. So, what do you get? Mod fx minus Gx the whole squared is going to be less than or equal to twice mod fx squared plus twice mod gx squared. That is how you see a 2 in the first displayed formula in the slide, the third integral that you see. And so, the first piece can be made less than epsilon squared by 3 and the last piece twice integral mod x bigger than pi minus delta that can also be made suitably small. Total thing is less than epsilon squared by 4. So, all in all, norm of f minus g, the L2 norm is less than epsilon by 2. So, finally, we come to step 4. We have this capital G which is 2 pi periodic, 
because it is vanishing at minus pi to pi. So I can extend it continuously on the whole real line as a 2 pi periodic function. By Fayer's theorem, this extension G, capital G, can be approximated by a trigonometric polynomial P such that the L2 norm of G minus P is less than epsilon by 2. So now, norm of F minus capital P is less than or equal to norm of F minus capital G plus norm of G minus P. The norm of F minus capital P is less than or equal to norm of F minus capital G plus norm of capital G minus capital P. Each of the two pieces is less than epsilon by 2. So the whole thing is less than epsilon. So we have approximated an L2 function little f by a trigonometric polynomial capital P in L2 norm. This approximation is going to be extremely important in the next item. Namely, we are going to prove the Parseval formula now. Remember that in module 2, we discussed the Parseval formula. We discussed the Bessel's inequality and the Parseval formula. And I said that the Parseval formula cannot be proved right now. Now we are ready to prove the Parseval formula. Why? Because we have this important theorem number 28. We have proved that any L2 function can be approximated by a trigonometric polynomial in L2 norm. This was the crucial ingredient that we needed in the proof of the Parseval formula. Now that we have this important ingredient, let us now proceed to prove the Parseval formula. What is the Parseval formula? Let us recall. Let us look at equation 3.4 in the displayed slide. The Parseval formula states that if f is in L2 of minus pi pi, then 1 upon 2 pi integral minus pi to pi mod fx squared dx equals mod a0 squared plus 1 half summation j from 1 to infinity mod a j squared plus mod b j squared. I had discussed the significance of this in module 2. Now let us get to the proof of this directly. Some of the terms in these displayed equations will be colored and the color is important. Let us now recall a couple of useful things. Suppose you got a trigonometric polynomial of degree n. Suppose p n x is a trigonometric polynomial with degree n and little n is larger than capital N. And I want to calculate the nth partial sum of the Fourier series for this p n. You take a trigonometric polynomial and write down the Fourier series. If you write down the Fourier series, the Fourier series will again be p n x and nothing else. Beyond capital N, the partial sums S n of p n x will agree with p n x. This is an important observation, a simple observation, but a critical observation. Now let us take a element in L2 of minus pi pi. Then let us apply the Pythagoras' theorem. You must go back to module 2 and look at the proof of Bessel's inequality. We used this Pythagoras' theorem, equation 3.5, crucially in the proof of the Bessel's inequality. Norm of f minus Sn fx squared plus norm of Sn of f of x squared equal to norm f squared. In equation 3.5, the three different terms have three different colors. Now, Actually, if you compute Sn fx squared, you are going to get equation 3.4, the blue item in equation 3.4, except that the j will go from 1 to n. Now, 3.4 will follow from 3.5 if we can show that the term displayed in red goes to 0, namely, the L2 norm of f minus Sn fx squared must go to 0 as n goes to infinity. The moment we do that, then what do we do? In equation 3.5, we allow the n to go to infinity. The red term goes to 0. The black term does not involve n, so it will remain as it is. The blue term norm of Sn of fx squared will simply go to the right hand side of 3.4 which is also displayed in blue 
except that you will get an extra factor of 2 pi. And when you divide by 2 pi, you get exactly equation 3.4. And that will complete the proof of Parseval formula. So what is our immediate concern? Our one and only immediate concern now is to prove the last claim, namely the thing in red goes to 0 as n goes to infinity, namely norm of f minus sn of f comma x the whole squared goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. So let us apply the Pythagoras' theorem to f minus pn where pn is a trigonometric polynomial with little n larger than or equal to capital N. So what does the Pythagoras' theorem read? Norm of f minus pn minus sn of f minus pn x the whole squared plus norm of sn of f minus pn the whole squared equal to norm of f minus pn squared. Now clearly sn of f minus pn is sn of f minus sn of pn. You see the Fourier series of a function is linear. If I take two functions f and g and write the Fourier series for f plus g, I will get the Fourier series for f plus the Fourier series for g. And so the nth partial sums will likewise be the sum of the nth partial sums of the individual functions. So Sn of f minus pn is Sn of f minus Sn of pn. But we have seen that the nth partial sum of pn is again pn. So what do we get? Sn of f minus pn is Sn of f minus pn. So what do we get? If you look at the first piece, norm of f minus pn minus Sn of f minus pn. The pn cancels out. We simply get f minus Sn f norm squared. Plus what do we have? Plus we have norm of Sn of f minus pn squared. So the first displayed equation in the slide goes over to the third displayed equation in the slide with the red term being highlighted there. So now we knock off the middle term and we conclude that norm of f minus Sn of fx is less than or equal to norm of f minus pn when n is larger than capital N. So this was the crucial step. But now, given any epsilon greater than 0, we can bring in a trigonometric polynomial pn such that norm of f minus pn is less than epsilon. So we conclude that the red term norm of f minus sn of fx is less than epsilon when little n is larger than capital N. That completes the proof of Parseval's formula via Fejer's theorem. So this was an important theorem in chapter 2 which we could not prove in chapter 2 but now we have completed the proof in chapter 3. So now let us look at another aspect of Fayer's theorem. We are going to use Fayer's theorem to prove a very important theorem in number theory. This theorem is a very classical theorem which goes back to Leopold Kronecker. It is sometimes known as Dirichlet's theorem. So let us recall Dirichlet's theorem. Suppose alpha is an irrational number, we consider the sequence of numbers brace bracket alpha, brace bracket 2 alpha, brace bracket 3 alpha dot dot dot. If alpha is irrational, what is the brace bracket of theta? It is theta minus integer part of theta, that is a fractional part of theta. The brace bracket of theta is the fractional part of theta. So in the numbers listed in 3.6, all of them are in the closed interval 0, 1. And if theta is irrational, it will actually be in the open interval 0, 1. They are all distinct. Why are the numbers in 3.6 all distinct? Because suppose if k alpha brace bracket equal to l alpha brace bracket where k is less than l, then what happens? The brace bracket is basically k alpha minus square bracket k alpha. And brace bracket of l alpha is what? l alpha minus square bracket l alpha. So we get k minus l alpha equal to square bracket k alpha minus square bracket l alpha which would mean alpha is a ratio of two integers and alpha would be a rational number. So the sequence 3.6 all the terms are going to be distinct in other words 3.6 is an infinite set of distinct numbers in the open interval 0 1 
and so they will have limit points in 0 1 that's a Bolzano of Weierstrass's theorem right every infinite subset of closed interval 0 1 has limit points what Kronecker's theorem says is that not only will this set of numbers 3.6 have limit points every element in 0 1 will be a limit point that means that the elements listed in 3.6 are dense in the interval 0 1 it is not difficult to prove this fact but let us now go to some examples now as a first exercise let us go and show that sin 1 sin 2 sin 3 etc has least upper bound 1 it is clearly bounded above by 1 sin 1 sin 2 sin 3 all have 1 as a upper bound but how do you know that 1 is a least upper bound how do you know that 0.99999 is not the least upper bound. We have to show that given any epsilon greater than 0, 1 minus epsilon to 1, in that interval 1 minus epsilon to 1, these elements show up. Sin 1, sin 2, sin 3, some elements in the sequence land up in the interval 1 minus epsilon 1, no matter how small epsilon is. That is what is the meaning of saying that 1 is the least upper bound. I recommend that you should do this and you should convince yourself that 1 is indeed the least upper bound. The Kronecker's theorem will be critical in the proof of this. The second problem says that if you have a continuous function from R to R and if it is periodic with two periods lambda and mu that are linearly independent over the rationals, then f is constant. You can have periodic functions on the real line with one period say sin x, it has period 2 pi. If a function has period pi, it will also have period 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi, etc. So, if a function has two periods lambda and mu, which are such that one period is an integer multiple of the other period, then whichever is a smaller one in absolute value will serve as a basic period. But now, if you have two periods, which are not rational multiples of one another. If they are linearly independent over the rationals, then you have to show that this function is constant. This is another application of Kronecker's theorem. As a third application of Kronecker's theorem, we look at the solutions of a differential equation. y double prime plus y equal to sin root 2 t. Some of these solutions will be periodic because this will have solution c1 cos t plus c2 sin t plus a non-zero constant times sin root 2 t. So, if I take c1 equal to 0 and c2 equal to 0, it is simply constant times sin root 2 t and that is periodic. But if c1 is not 0 or if c2 is not 0, then the exercise is for you to show that this solution will not be periodic. You may also have heard of Lisseus figures in connection with coupled harmonic oscillators in physics. Can you relate these to Kronecker's theorem when the frequency or the coupled harmonic oscillators are incommensurable, then these Lissajous figures form a dense subset of the square. That is why when you see it in the oscilloscope, you only see a rectangle which is lit and not a nice sharp closed curve. And I suggest you look at the website on Lissajous figures and you try to understand the connection with Kronecker's theorem when the frequencies are commensurable or incommensurable what happens. Here we shall stop this module.